Welcome, everybody, to Dead Talk Live. And tonight, we have a very special guest that I'm really excited about. Help welcome, I mean, help me welcome Tate Ellington. Tate, how are you doing? I'm fantastic. Doing great. <laughs> oh, man. So let's just get right on it. And the messages we exchanged before tonight, you told me you are a big horror fan. How far back do you remember? Like, when was it that you became a horror fan? Uh, God, I think like, uh, it's been since I was in, I want to say the fourth grade. Uh, so however old that is, was it like 13, I guess, 12, 13. Um, I think the first horror film I ever watched, uh, more like ghost would be, uh, the haunting, the original black and white, uh, still probably my favorite. <laughs> of all time. Uh, and then I remember a double feature I had for like a birthday party in the fifth grade that was, um, we watched Aliens. That was my first time seeing that one. And uh, my first Friday the 13th was uh, Jason Takes Manhattan. Oh, wow. Wow. <laughs> Would you say horror played any kind of influence in you going into acting? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, uh, I it's one of those where like I always have always loved it. I like being scared. Um, I love the intensity of horror films. I love getting to do them. So anytime I can, I always jump at the chance. Um, but yeah, I would say initially i started as a artist so that was a thing i did in school uh like high school all that but i usually like to paint sort of draw dark subject matter and so i think that absolutely um used to rent horror movies like probably every weekend one or two and just went through eventually the uh the local uh video store when we actually still had them yeah. <laughs> just showing my age there but uh but yeah man 100 percent. like it's my it's my favorite genre i think now going back besides horror i mean you said you were an artist and stuff and i see all the the paintings you yes, have in the right. background uh self-promotion <laughs> <laughs> no that's awesome when did you uh you know really get serious and go ahead first into acting like getting an agent, start auditioning and whatnot. Uh, pretty much uh, the I I ended up going to school for it. Uh, I did a play, like one of the few uh, sort of theaters uh, we had in my hometown. Um, did a play there when I was in high school. Loved it. Um, decided that's what I wanted to do. You know, went to college for it. Um, but basically, I worked right out of college for one year in a place in uh, Columbus and also in Kentucky. Uh, Columbus, Ohio, and uh, Newport, Kentucky. Then got in a car, had a good friend. We drove to New York, uh, got an apartment, and then just started hitting the pavement. Um, so fortunately, was able to survive. Uh, had some loving parents who uh, not everybody gets that gift. So, <laughs> so, uh, many times of like, I'm broke. Um, can you guys help out? Um, but yeah, like really just started hitting the pavement uh back then we still had like backstage and stuff so you go get the the actual like trade paper look up auditions yeah. head there go to them now i assume uh, since you went to new york you were looking into theater before yeah. any kind of film yeah um i'd gone to school for theater loved theater um but i you know i grew up watching movies so i always wanted to do film but my my college really didn't have any focus on that um so but i love the stage it's been a long time since i've been on it um but especially right now <laughs> <laughs> not a whole lot of finally getting back to theater but yeah um but uh but yeah it's it's that's why i went to new york because i absolutely love being on stage i love the theater and so had gone for that and knew that we still had plenty of tv and film in new york um oh, yeah. but i knew that la didn't really have um it's got a decent theater base. It has a wonderful theater community, but um, but if you really want to do theater, New York's kind of the place to be. So, yeah. Now, when you were hitting the pavement in New York, did you manage to get any roles in any off Broadway or even Broadway productions? <laughs> I got uh, a lot of roles in some very off off. <laughs> off, <laughs> off uh, I did actually. I got to do uh, finally one Broadway show right before I left. I did a show called uh, The Philanthropist. Um, at the uh, Roundabout Theater uh, yeah, on Broadway. That. Yeah, and uh, I got to work with um, Matthew Broderick um, uh, and uh, Jonathan Cake, wow. uh, Stephen wow. Weber, who uh, I was a huge fan of, and who uh, Matthew and Stephen were uh, just absolutely wonderful human beings. <laughs> so had an amazing time, like loved getting on the subway and heading to the theater, man. It was amazing. Well, so much, you know, uh, you know, regard is given to Broadway and all the theaters and Broadway. 
Uh, my area that I would love to hang out would be Greenwich Village. And there's so many amazing theater productions that are way, way off Broadway down there in the village that happen there. Uh, I mean, what do you think about that? Oh, no, I love it down there. I mean, anytime uh, I still have so many friends that live in New York who still do theater in New York. And um, that's I mean, that's sort of the the grit of it all. And it's it's that's one of the things I miss the most. I love L.A., but I miss sort of the grittiness of uh, New York and that part of town. Um, any of the theater productions there, I got to do a few that were like things for the Fringe Festival, stuff like that. And some of those were always the best. Um because you really got to dive into stuff and really got to experiment and just had a good time and weren't necessarily having to make sure that the box office was bringing in money. So, <laughs> so you were OK to play because, uh, yeah, people like to make money. So usually they want to tend to, to have a good show to do so. <laughs> exactly. Now, there has rarely been an actor that I've spoken to who has not gotten their start on stage. Uh, yeah. Almost all of them have. Uh, do you think if you were giving advice to someone, would you advise them to get their start in theater? Let's say they want to go into film. Okay. They, you know, they're okay with theater, but they want to get into motion pictures, whether it be television or film. Would you recommend to them, listen, get, get on stage, get comfortable being in front of an audience. Absolutely. I think, um, one thing about being on stage, especially, is that it's it's in the moment. It's live. Uh, you can't hide. Yeah. <laughs> so, so basically, I mean, if if you go up on a line, you got to find a way to get yourself out of it. Um, if you you're dependent on your other actors on stage to help you out, you know, it's it's a living, breathing thing when you're on stage. Um, and I think that only helps uh, with film and TV because there's a comfort level you get when being on stage of being that open that uh presented to the world that then on a set you've got sometimes 100 people sitting there staring at you you know sometimes while you're half naked or you're in a harness up in the sky or you know just everything you can imagine and so i think that comfort of being in front of that many people uh that you get from being on stage absolutely helps with uh with film and tv um that, yeah, that just, that makes yeah. absolute sense. So explain for you, how did yeah. that transition happen from being in New York, being in the off-Broadway plays, Broadway plays, transition into uh, TV and film? Uh, it sort of all happened at the same time, because basically I would, just as much as I was pursuing anything on stage, at the same time would be going out for student films, short films, anything I could find especially in them that could pay money, but <laughs> sometimes those are hard to get to. Yeah. Um, and so sort of did that, and that's where I learned about film and TV. It was basically, again, sort of like on, uh, you know, uh, on the job training. Um, anytime I'd be on any sort of set, no matter what level of film it was, I would always be looking around seeing how everybody did everything. Uh, I started, um, which I, I recommend to some people if you um, doing uh, uh, background artist work. Um, I did that in New York uh, early on when I was there. That's where I learned how a set worked. You know, yeah. I would just sit look around and listen to everything everybody was saying and any sort of things they were, uh, any of this sort of lingo or anything like that. Um, and then basically like sort of just kept doing that and, and got really fortunate. My first like big break was through um, a play I did um, for the Fringe Festival ended up doing that. I had a, um, a woman who's now kind of one of my guardian angels for work. <laughs> His name's uh, Meg Simon. I, I, we'd finished the show. I walked out, was talking to some friends and then she just came up to me and was like, hi, um, I'm Meg. I've got, you know, uh, I think there's something you'd be right for. I'd like for you to come in to see me, handed me a card. And like, I was kind of, like, Oh, thank you so much. You know, see you later. And, uh, and then the friends I was with were like, do, do you have any idea who that was? I was like, not a clue. Who was it? And, uh, and they were like, no, that's the head of casting at Warner Brothers for wow. New York. Like, and so there's like, oh, God, you know. And so then uh, called and, and had my first uh, TV audition with her. And she was one of those people who was so kind and so loving to actors. She sat down with me because I didn't know what I was doing and really, like, coached me through the auditions. Like, here's how you get the job. You know, I was like, okay. And, um, and got, like, my first TV test through that and, like, and sort of then got my – uh, my agent, my lawyer, my manager, all that. So, yeah, it was one of those. Everything fell into place. Yeah, 100%. <laughs> all right. Now, there are several projects. You have a lot of stuff on your resume. Great stuff. Uh, Thanks. Where I got to know you, as I told you in the pre-call, was in Quantico. 
Okay. Yeah. Uh, the TV show Quantico, uh, that show premiered and it became an instant big hit. Oh, yeah. uh, back in the days when seasons would be 26 episodes. It seems like those <laughs> yeah. days just disappeared. Those days ago. <laughs> <laughs> so you, like 15, you know, yeah, like. now it's everything, you know, you'd be lucky if you get a 13 episode season out of something. I'm not saying it's either bad or good. It's just things have changed. Now, yeah. Simon Asher, that's the role. Uh, yeah. One of the biggest roles in the first season of Quantico a very, uh, I would say by far, the most complicated character in the first season of Quantico. Very mysterious character, and in the end, you be you are the hero. You are the hero of the season. So walk us through how the role came your way, when you got to read what this character was going to be about, what were your feelings. Tell us about the Quantico experience. Absolutely. Like, um, basically, I, um, it's almost sort of a running joke for me in work because I would constantly test. <laughs> so it'd be, and testing, if anybody doesn't know, there's like you, you do your audition, you go see producers, then normally for a TV show like Quantico or something like that, you then go to a studio test where it'll be all the people in the studio, sometimes like 20 people in the room, depending, all staring at you. You do your audition, you leave. If they like you, then they go, all right, we want to see you for network. So that maybe a day later, two days later, then you will go to the network test, which is even more people, even more awkward. Uh, and you're just there. And it's usually you and one other person uh, against each other and uh, sometimes three. Uh, and and then you find out quite literally like, oh, you didn't get it. <laughs> but you've already signed a contract uh, with all the money you might make and all the stuff you'll get. <laughs> and, and then find out you didn't get it. So you go home, you know. Um, but I had so many times of getting on planes where I'd be flown out and do that and all those things. Um, for Quantico, I lucked out because I'd, I'd shot a pilot the year before, uh, went in for this one. Um, casting director, who is a uh, wonderful uh, Robert Ulrich, um, uh, I hadn't seen him in a long time, so he asked me to come in. I was like, yeah, of course, went in. And then fortunately, they were like, we really like you for the role of Simon. Uh, we don't have anybody to test against you yet, but um, we want to see you for the test. We'll let you know when we have somebody you can test against. Great. Um, luckily, I got another test offer. And essentially, when you go for those tests, you sign the contract. So if they if they hire you, you're you're unavailable from that point on. Yeah. You're doing it. And so I was on my way to um, the other tests. Like my people had called, uh, you know, had called uh, ABC and uh quantico on them and said like you might lose him so if you want to test him you got to test him right now or either you know figure out what you want to do um so i got the call on the way to the other test they just said you're booked you got the job wow. i didn't have to test it's the first time that's ever happened uh i don't think it'll ever happen again for me um it was amazing pulled over the side of the road um and so then then went to shoot the pilot we shot the pilot in atlanta um and and it was one of the best times I've had. Uh, the pilot was absolutely wonderful. Had such a good time doing it. Um, Love that whole cast. Still friends with all of them. They're still amazing, amazing people that I will always be friends with. Mm -hmm. um, and we basically, like, from the jump, I I absolutely love Simon. It was, um, I put about as much as I could of me into him. And then also, for the whole time shooting, we never really knew where a character was going to go. Okay. We could kind of ask Josh Safran, who was the uh, showrunner writer. Um, he'd give us hints. He'd kind of be like, "I can tell you this, but I, I can't tell you if you're the bad guy or not." You know. So we're like, "Okay." So basically, I every scene we shot, I would do one take where I was a good guy and one take where I was a bad guy, and like I did it in my own head to some degree, but would always kind of do a take with the idea that if I'm told, you know, oh, no, you're you're actually the villain, you're the, you're the main, you know, you're the terrorist, you're the guy who set off the explosions, that I would always know I had done takes that they could use for that. And so, you know, that it was an amazing... so technique. weird. It's like you oh. were shooting a duality. Are you were shooting... Yeah. Yeah, like you never knew where you sort of stood. And so we'd find out essentially like each, you know, week when we get a script, okay, here's where you're going. And I came to find out, had we not gotten our, our sort of back end order, 
that they were potentially going to make me uh, the bad guy, where it was kind of like, we're, we're leading where we can go there, but we really love your character. We love this. We love where it's going. We got our extended order. Okay, we want you to go this direction. But there was a world where I would have been the, uh, the, the terrorist. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um, and so getting to do that, we, we shot the entire show uh, after the pilot. We went to Montreal, shot the whole show there. Um, very cold. <laughs> like, really cold. Um, but loved Montreal. It was a wonderful city. Uh, would love to go back. And one of those things where I, I had never been a full series regular for something that shot that long. And it was an amazing experience to learn how to do that and also taking ownership of your own character and that, that like Simon became mine. That's sort of like, no, I, I also have input on this character and, and he's part of me and that's, and so, um, I was trying to think too, like the, uh, finding out that, that, uh, I found out I was going to blow up the week before I was going to blow up. <laughs> like, uh, I got, I had an itching suspicion. I was like, this character's great. I feel like it's going to make a, Big dramatic thing if he dies. I got a feeling they're going to kill me. Um, told my wife that. She was like, damn it, you're probably right. I was like, yeah. We went to the movies one day. Uh, I forgot what we'd gone to see. I want to say maybe it was like was it Superman Donna Justice. Anyway, I, I turned on my phone. I When we, you know, movie's over, I turned on my phone. I had like a text from my manager. Then I had a phone call from my manager saying, call me. Then another thing saying, call me. And I looked at my wife. I was like, That's it. I just got <laughs> she was like what i was like i'm pretty sure i just died so i just called bob and that's my manager bob Glenn, and uh and i was you know it's like i died didn't i he's like yeah <laughs> they killed you i was like all right well how do i go out you know it's like i think you blow up i was like great <laughs> like, let's see what happens but Sim um, but simon's arc okay looking back on yeah. the character of simon and i'm talking about the version that made it to television uh he had such an amazing arc from the from the beginning, the suspicion, everyone thinking it's you, uh, to in the end taking that uh, nuclear device and driving off the bridge, I believe, sacrificing yes, yes. <laughs> yourself to save everybody else. How do you feel about? Because I mean, think if you were the bad guy, you were not going to make it to season two. No. So, <laughs> did you prefer to? end up being the hero the one that sacrifices himself to save all your friends yeah i mean end of the day um it's one of those things because sometimes it's so hard in this job and especially that type of show where where it's because sometimes limited shows now when they have 10 episodes you know where it's going you know where it ends um with something like this you never knew for me now obviously i like having a job so i would have been totally fine <laughs> to make it but it was one of those things too where even with that, even if you survive some seasons, that doesn't mean you're always coming back. Yeah. Sometimes you can off the show. Sometimes the characters don't work. So for me as an actor, it was really wonderful to to get to have a conclusion to that character. Like, because I I love that character. Mm -hmm. It was one that still means a lot to me. Um, it's it's something I really poured everything I had into, and so getting to have you know kind of a hero's end. Like, not everybody gets that in TV. A lot of, you know, you don't sometimes get to have that complete a complete arc to your character, like you do in a film or something like that. Um, so I, I really loved it. I loved doing those scenes. It was um, getting to do like the phone call to uh, to um, uh, Raina for like Yasmin's uh, character, uh, who's also, I uh, love her to death. And so it was amazing. I was doing all my scenes with her. Um, and um, and also the same with like Priyanka's character, because I loved, I loved the way that character became in many ways, in, in many ways her her sidekick or sort of her also yeah. rock that she could go to and somebody she could depend on. I love that that relationship developed between them. Um, and that wasn't always there. That was something they just found through the writing and were like, Oh yeah, this works. Um, but yeah, I love getting to, I got to do the stunt of like pulling out. Like I got to like floor it when I'm supposed to be driving away with the bomb. They're like, you want to do it? I was like, absolutely. <laughs> so, you know, got to like peel out, floor it going down this road. And then I did the, I was driving on the bridge. Um, you're really only going like 30 miles per hour, maybe. You're not going that fast, but I scared the hell out of the crew. Like, with more and more takes, we're getting closer, you know. And, and then, like, the director was kind of like David was, he's like, can you kind of jerk the car a little bit? We don't want to put anybody at risk, you know, but can you? Because we want to see it, and it's nicer if we can see it with you. And I was like, yeah, of course, I got it. 
on one of those takes, I, I pulled a little hard and got kind of close to, <laughs> to the hedge. <laughs> yeah. It was an empty bridge, you know, nobody was on it, but uh, I, they, they all definitely let out a sigh of relief. You know, they were like, okay, that's it. That, that one scared us. <laughs> like, we're good. Um, so Quantico yeah. was, a, like I said, a huge success in the first season. After the season was over, it aired. Uh, what did it change for you in your career? Uh, it, it opened up so many doors for me. It was one of those because I... Like I said, it always I'd had work, I'd been around, I'd always um, you know been very close to things, and so this was one of those that finally was very much like, no, you can you can maintain a character in a series, you can maintain a character for twenty one episodes, and and as an actor, that's a big thing, and as people hiring you, that's a big thing. They want to see that you can handle something, they want to see they can depend on you to show up, they want to make sure that. With with every job, like you're you're always wanting to make sure you're putting your best forward because you never know who's watching. And and that's how you get work. There's so many times I've had work through, oh, so and so saw me in this and I didn't realize they had seen that and then they got a call for that. And and so I think it really it gave me a confidence I didn't have before with acting, I think, in a lot of ways. And then it also let me know I was able to do that. And then also there's something about being a series regular. I think, like I said before, like you get to have ownership of the character like you don't sometimes in other things. Mm -hmm. And and it's more of a collaboration with your your directors and your writers. And that I realized at one point on set, I, I had a director who I really loved, but he had given me a, a kind of note that made no sense based on the last episode. And and normally I don't ever rock the boat. I try my best to just kind of, all right, yeah, whatever you need. Let me let me work it out. But I knew it didn't make any sense because I was like, in the last episode, like we were screaming at each other. Why would I be doing that now? And then I kind of realized he hadn't seen that episode. <laughs> you know, like, he's here doing his job and he's doing an amazing job, but he actually hasn't seen all these episodes. So he doesn't know that. And so I had to kind of, I, I ended up writing our, our showrunner because they were they were actually in New York and we were in Montreal. And you know, I was like, hey, Josh, I, I, I don't want to step on any toes, but this doesn't make any sense. He was like, oh, yeah, no, don't do that. <laughs> he was like, do what you think. We, we know you. We trust you. You know, they just didn't know what was going on. I was like, all right, great. Um, but that's a really huge thing, I think, for an actor, especially on the TV show, to to feel that ownership of yeah. the character yeah. that they're also putting themselves into. Uh, um, and also, and yeah, the longer you're in it, I've heard this plenty of times as well, the writers start writing the character around you. Absolutely. Like, absolutely. it becomes, And that happened a lot for this, where it was basically like, at one point, we were given some room. With, with network stuff, it is a lot of times where those scripts go through like 20 different people, 30 different. I mean, like, it is approved down to everything. The line is approved. And so there isn't a lot of room to play. On some shows there is, they want you to play a lot, but on certain things they're like, nope, that's the script, don't deviate. Mm -hmm. um, eventually, like maybe like midway through sh through our you know our uh, season, I, I was given some liberty where they were basically just like, no, no, anything you ever come up with works great, always try it. I was like, okay, great. So it really was a thing where they started to allow me to have much more input on what Simon did or said or a change of a line here. Or this is, a, you know, I think this was way, the way he would do that or approach this. Um, and so I think that's that's a really big thing. And like normally for, I'm trying to think what the saying is, it's like the first season, who's it for? It's like the second or third season is where the actors get all the power, where they are like, no, 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 I'm established. I'm this character, <laughs> you know. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those. So I think... Well, you it showed a lot of trust. And we're not talking about, like, a small night. This was on ABC. And yeah. it showed that they had a lot of trust in you to give you that Absolutely. freedom in the first season of a, of a show. So Absolutely. that's awesome. And they were fun. Like, yeah. And the same, like, I always have to say, too, like, one of the best things was uh, Priyanka uh, Chopra, who's, you know, she's a megastar. Mm -hmm. She's, like, I didn't really uh, know who she was initially. And I see, like, oh, 15 million followers on Instagram. <laughs> Like, okay. Oh, she's the, one of the biggest stars, you know, in, in India. Okay, great. Awesome. A lot um, of people don't know that she made the transition from uh, yep. Indian Bollywood over yep. into American television. Yeah. And that this was, that was one of the big things for her was basically like, she was kind of handed with ABC. They were like, we want to work with you. Here's our scripts. Which one would you like to do? And she chose Quantico. And um, I've never seen anybody 
work as hard. Like she's one of those people who absolutely busted her ass. There was one time she had to go finish filming a movie she had been working on in Bollywood in India where then she had the weekend. She left shooting Quantico. I'm going to say on Thursday or Friday, flew to India. Wow. Got wow. on a helicopter, I think, that flew her to the location, shot her scenes, got back <laughs> on an airplane, flew back, arrived like Monday to shoot again, like, you know, wow. full day. So, wow. I mean, it was one of those where she's a workhorse. So, so it, was, it was amazing to watch that. So, That's you know. dedication. So yeah. let's move on from Quantico. So yeah, one night I'm sitting on the couch, you know, trying to find something to watch. I come across this movie called The Endless. I'm like, all right, you know, sounds good. I started watching it. I love the film, and you're, of course, in it. And as the movie goes on, I start recognizing it, that it's uh, like sort of a carryover from another movie that I saw several years prior called (laughs) Resolution. Now, there is, The Endless was great. You were great in The Endless. and uh, But the filmmakers, I don't know if it's the filmmakers, the studio, or what, insist that the endless is not a sequel to resolution but it's obviously in the same universe uh first of all uh when you got to when you booked the job for the endless uh had you seen or known anything about resolution i i had not seen resolution i'm trying to think if i i had watched spring i think i i once i knew i was going in for these guys i wanted to know some about them so I think I watched Spring, uh, which is an amazing film. Uh, it's beautifully done, and uh, Lou Taylor Pucci does an amazing job. And um, I don't believe I'd watch Resolution. Once I knew I was doing it, I think then I watched Resolution. I 100% they're in the same universe. Like, oh, yeah. It's not necessarily a, a sequel, or like it's still, I mean, you know, if you've seen The Endless, you know, it's like all these sort of like parallel bubbles within each time and time frames. And, uh, and so. It's definitely within that world of like not being able to break out of your sort of circle, out of your uh, your cycle. Um, but yeah, these guys, I got, I went in for them. Uh, it was pretty great because I'm still friends with them. Uh, David Lawson, so we went axe throwing uh, like a couple weeks back. <laughs> so still see him all through the pandemic. He was doing a thing called, uh, which was amazing, uh, called Porch Beers, where it would be all these great like filmmakers and writers and horror directors and everything like we just get together over Zoom, having a beer and just chat about work. And so it was always amazing just to sit in on that and listen. Um, but yeah, like they, I went in, I auditioned. I really wanted it because I loved the character, but I was very afraid I was too young. I was sort of like, I feel like they want somebody who looks older than me. Could be my age, but I feel like I, I always sometimes play too young. Mm-hmm. And um, went in. I thought I nailed it. I did a great job. And then basically like found out, oh, you did. Like you were pretty much, you walked in, you're like, well, we found our guy. And they're like, the only issue is your age. We're afraid you're too young. They were like, but we really want you. Can we like dye your hair <laughs> or something? So I was like, sure, whatever you need to do. Um, so that was one of the, um, one of my favorite times, I think, filming. Um, and I just got to do something like it recently. But um, we were just at a kids camp uh, just outside of San Diego for two weeks. Shot the whole thing there. Uh, they did have some other location shoots where they went to the place they used for resolution. Yeah. Um, but one of those where you're just there, few lights, great camera. Like Justin um, is an amazing writer. He was focusing more on his acting. On this one, uh, Aaron was doing a little bit more of the directing on this and focusing on that. And Aaron's an amazing DP. He's an amazing director. Same for Justin. And so it was really wonderful getting to watch those guys work. Now, um, did, did they do any, uh, did they explain to you at all that uh, this movie oh, is he, in the same universe as uh, another movie called Resolute? How did they explain it to you? They basically, we went through and they were sort of like, this is part of, because part of The Endless is a, it's a tie-in in in a way with it in that it is this being stuck in loops. And it depends on how large your loop is. Our loop for uh, my group was probably about like 100 years. Like, so we would cycle back through and come in. You see in the film where there's one loop for some poor bastard. It was like seven seconds. You're like, that's just a never ending hell. Yeah. and so for them, they, they explain, like, this is all still part of our 
our sort of shared universe that they have created uh, on their own. And if you watch uh, Synchronic, which I highly suggest, wonderful oh, movie. Oh, yeah, they... I just saw it last week. It, oh, okay, great. Uh, if you notice, uh, anybody who's really paying attention will notice uh, the drug they're using is kind of from our film. Oh. Is, uh, the Red so it's a little bit of a tie in there that like the drug we've been making and using the what's kind of called the Red Leaf is also kind of what they're using to manufacture the drug that's in that. Which is a so, time travel I, drug. Yeah, yeah. So it's just a little bit of like them sort of doing a nod and a wink, but also tying in these worlds. I think they all do encompass the same world in a way, uh, at least for me, I believe. Oh, and yeah. I, I would yeah. say too, so yeah. And now, um, do you, it's never really, you know, what I love about those, you know, like The Endless and Resolution, it's not, the whole plot is not handed to you on a civil a silver platter it's left up to a lot of viewer interpretation is this just um that area is it like a i don't know like a, a black hole on earth where time loops itself is it extraterrestrial when you were doing the role how did you play it did you say did you tell yourself all right this is extraterrestrial this is interdimensional how did For you me i mean what explanation did you come up with for me, I sort of took it as that this was a almost like a wouldn't have saved it like a time warp or a black hole or whatever you want to say like a a where dimensions collide, but but on its own in this place. Uh, some others might see it as the entire world. For me, I took it as it being very central to this location. Yeah. This was very precise. Uh, you you went too far outside of uh, of the what they call the hoodoo sticks would be now you're fine. You're in your own world. But in this place, it is almost the sort of, sometimes they'll say, you know, like it's almost like soap bubbles for dimensions. And I, I think there are, so <laughs> I do believe in like sort of parallel universe and, you know, what's right next to you, what's right next to this rubbing up against each other. And I think there was a lot to that. That's yeah. what I try to say to myself and focus on was that I am stuck in this place, but I understand it and I know it. And I'm comfortable with it, but I do think for my character too, that's his grip on reality. Yeah. Because otherwise, if I had to go too much further, then I might lose it. Like, because yeah. I think I, I think a lot of it, I think like most things, a lot has to do with control. And I think that's at least for my character had a lot to do with control, trying to control these things, trying to control the people around him without realizing it. Um, and what's weird that, is that the people in those loops, they know. Uh, pretty much that they're in a loop. Uh, at least some of them do. Yeah. They know yeah. that this is repeating for them. Yes, like uh, the, our group, the one that was at the camp, 100% uh, understood that they were going to keep repeating this. And that's kind of like even uh, um, uh, Shane, I'm telling the character's name, but uh, like he referenced doing the magic trick and also things like that, that like you do a thing like a thousand times or whatever, is it 10,000 times or but you become perfect at it. And so this group knew they had about a hundred years. And so they would just keep trying to get better at something. That's what for me, for my character was the math equation, okay. like constantly trying to figure that out um, and never getting the answer I wanted, you know, but I'll just keep trying. I'll have one more loop. Yeah. We'll start again and I'll try it again. Um, now would you it, class? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, I've gone. No, no, no. You go. go I was going to ask you: Would you classify the Endless as a purely science fiction film? Would you cross it sci-fi horror? How would you classify it? For me, I, I felt it more as being like sci-fi horror, and and not horror in your typical sense, yeah. but a um, there was definitely to me a. <sighs> an eeriness to it like i think with justin and aaron both would agree like it's got a very like lovecraft sort of element yeah. to it in a way and so um i was scared when reading the script i also love anything uh, that does deal with the cult i felt like i lived in one sort of for a year or so <laughs> got a very like, personal connection to it um but so anything with that where where you have a leader who seemingly is a wonderful person and doing everything they can is still pushing everyone towards a place. And, and I think you notice with our group, there was a certain sadness among some of the yeah. characters. There was a, I want out of this and I can't get out. And I, I, I finally come to an end where I don't want to do this anymore, you know? Um, but me being the leader kept pushing for it. And that's, you know, what I want. Yeah. Yeah. As far as me and, and that I think falls into a horror element mm -hmm. of, I think 
I think anything dealing with someone exerting a lot of control over others uh, can always lead towards horror. Absolutely. Um, and so, so yeah, but I, but I definitely like definitely sci-fi and definitely for me, horror element definitely involved. Okay. Now let's move on to a movie that there is no doubt about it is horror. And that's Sinister <laughs> 2. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you play Dr. Stromberg in Sinister yes. 2. Uh, I assume you saw the first movie before yes, taking yeah, on this project. I, yeah. yeah, Ethan Hawke. It was a great yeah, film. It. Scary, really scary. Well, still, it's probably in like my. I would say still like top ten somewhere. Like it's it's I it's top ten, top fifteen. I watch it whenever I can. It terrifies the hell out of me, mostly because of the uh, the family videos. Oh, <laughs> like it's actually being a family man now. Uh, it is uh, just tears me apart. I still almost had to look away on those. Um, but but loved it. And so um, I went in for that one. So I knew what I was going in for. Got the audition, sort of almost flipped out. I was like, all right, damn it, I want this. Like, what do I, what do I got to do? Okay. Um, and what we did was essentially that scene where I'm explaining everything uh, that you see in the film. So I got it down. I went in. I felt like I nailed it. It was like, this is the best I can do with this, you know, and, until you give it to me and then I'll work harder. But like, let's see what happens. Went in. Thought I did great. Was always like, yeah, we'll see what happens. Um, and then I got a call. Like, uh, time went by. I'm trying to think how long it had been. And then I got a call. They were just like, it's yours. You got it. Awesome. Like, didn't go in and see anybody else, you know, and that's kind of rare. And so just booked straight from the tape. Um, and so I flipped out. I was so excited. Uh, our director, uh, Kieran Foy, um, Kieran Foy, um, was wonderful. Got to set. He was great. I knew some of his work. And then... Uh, and he's gone on to do a lot, uh, some pretty awesome stuff since then. But getting to do that character um, in any horror film, and I kind of maybe, I don't, like I always call it uh, Professor Exposition, where it's like, hi, I'm the guy who's now going to explain everything to you in the horror movie. <laughs> like, yeah. here's, the, here's what's happening, you know. Um, and that's what this character was. And I love those characters. Like some people, you know, sometimes they're not done well. But like, I love it getting that story like it because it almost becomes a campfire story mm -hmm. where you do have this i'm going to tell you a story there's a spirit you know that lives in the woods and uh, a long time ago this happened and and so going in for that scene i also love uh james ransone i'd seen him in the wire and all over the place and he's amazing loved him so we do that scene, we do all those, and I just had the best time of my life. I, I ate up every second of it. I had horror soundtracks playing for myself. Like, I grabbed, like, The Exorcist, like, that weird, like, horrible, uh, like, almost violin, creepy, yeah. creaky music. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, we went in, did it. I got to see uh, uh, Jason Blumhouse. Like, he was there for a bit. It was, you know, like, ah, <laughs> nice to see you. Love all the movies you've made. Um, and so, yeah, we, we shot it. I think I shot for maybe two or three days. Um, and the, be the best part of all of it, I, I'd mentioned David uh, Lawson, the porch beers. Uh, Robert Cargill, who wrote Sinister and wrote Sinister 2, I never met because we were on, never on set the same day. And so we were doing porch beers one night. The first time I joined, he's on there because he knows David really well. They're all friends. And so he's chatting. He's like, hey, Tate. I wrote the movie you were in, you know, <laughs> I was like, Oh God, I know. Like, so good to meet you. Um, he was like, it's good to finally meet, you know, you it was like, great. Um, but yeah, I, I absolutely ate it up and just had a blast. It was absolutely wonderful. It was now for me, Sinister, uh, Sinister two, the ending, when we see the tape and yeah. what they do, it was absolutely horrifying. Uh, when you got to see the finished product and you got to see the tape, and the ending, you know, uh, how did you feel about that ending? Oh, it freaked me out. Like, I mean, it's one of those two where, like, I, I, I like when anything is not quite resolved. You've got the like, basically, oh no, we're we're not really done yet. Like, this is uh, it kind of keeps going. Like, any sort of evil in the world can constantly come back in different forms and keep moving. And um, and I actually had to go back, and I'm trying to think if I had to do reshoots where. Um, I'm trying to think if I was breaking it up. There's something that didn't make it into the film. I'm trying to think what it was, where then I shot. Um, I ended up throwing my arm out of socket because I had to use a sledgehammer on something. <laughs> and like, so I had to do that. And the next thing I know, like I, I got home, I was like, oh, my God, my arm hurts so much. Um, but I loved it. I loved like um, I, I like any sort of twist with that. And the yeah. same for the first 
I love that it ended up being, you know, the daughter, yeah. and I love it's it's the kids. It's the like, kids. The demon yeah. basically gets a hold of the kids and and yeah. as the kids murder their parents and family yeah. and they get it all on tape. Now let's move on to a film that I just saw for the first time two weeks ago, and that's Belzebus. Belzebus. How do you pronounce that? Belzebeth. Belzebeth. Uh, Belzebeth. Okay, uh, yeah, Belzebeth. Belzebeth. Now uh never heard of it. Ran across <laughs> it, read the synopsis. I'm like this sounds interesting. The movie's great. It's like half Spanish, half English. Yeah. Uh you play uh an FBI agent who basically is a paranormal expert. Okay. Yes. And you're tracking uh basically these uh it's to sum it up, it's about the second coming of Christ in a way. Yes. So, uh, what did what were your initial thoughts when you read the script for Belzebeth? Uh, I loved it. I mean, like I said, it's basically like anything, and I always tell my agents and, and my manager, really, anything that's horror, please send my way. Like, if there's ever anything, because it's, it's, I just love doing it. So, um, and I love the people involved in it, because, like, some of your, everybody who's around horror is fascinating. Yes. <laughs> like, it's the best to work with, and they're there for it, because they love it. Um, and I love that energy on a set. Um, they sent it. i trying to think. One, the second I knew, they were like, okay, so you're going to be a priest, FBI agent, uh, who's uh, going to perform exorcism at some point. I was like, I'm in. Uh, what do I need to do? <laughs> uh, and so then went in. It was one of those two where, like, I think for the one of the scenes we had to do was the kind of like doing the exorcism. I think it's what happens in the tunnels at one point where we're screaming out, going through the, you know, the 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 exorcist right, uh, exorcism right, and everything else, and reading all the words. And so I'm in the audition room, just like screaming at the top of my lungs, casting out, you know, a demon, and you know, and casting directors are like, "That's great!" <laughs> like I was like, I, "We'll see. Let me know." Um, and so then, then like you know, I'd read the script before that and loved it. I um, from the jump, it was one of those because the first scene, for anybody who hasn't seen it, I don't want to like give it too much away, but also if you have, you know what I'm talking about in the hospital. It's one of the most vicious scenes I've read on the page. I knew that was going to be a hard one to watch. And and that's so, exactly what I wanted to ask my next question yeah. about. That opening se- sequence in the uh, nursery, in the hospital, yeah. me but, being yeah. a lifelong horror fan, it yeah. even made me cringe because yeah. you're seeing this horrible stuff happening to these newborn babies. Yeah. When yeah. you first read that on paper... Uh, where you're like, man, how is the audience, no matter how much they love horror, how are they going to react to this? 100%. That, w- that was probably my biggest concern. Like, because initially it was one of those where you're like, I don't know if I can do this. Where where it was like, this one really bothers me. And, yeah. I, and I have my, uh, my daughter was, uh, my first guy of two, my daughter was um, only like six months old at that point, yeah. maybe seven months. Um, and so... I had just been through that and knew what that place looked like, knew how that place was supposed to be. And so it's a place of, you know, so much joy and all that. And, and reading that really kind of tore me apart. And so I really had to think like, do you want to do this? Do you want to, do you want to be in this? Cause this is pretty vicious. Mm-hmm. Ultimately decided to do it. Um, but I will say when I, cause I wasn't there for the taping of those scenes. No. And so I watched it. It was rough. <laughs> like it, it was a hard one to to take in. And and one of the things is well, the rest of the film I don't think ever pushes it that far. It, yeah. it pushes everything in a great way, but it never gets to that. And and even talking to Emilio, our director, um, that was one where I was like, "All right, what do you do?" And he was like, "I it's intense, and I I want that sort of the most like." horrible thing i can think of and i was like okay that's you know it. like that's it you it. nailed it do you uh appreciate filmmakers who take things to another level like that scene and it worked out i mean it was hard to watch but it really added to the movie and the intensity of it it was a risk and i think it paid off yeah. uh do you respect uh filmmakers who try to push the boundaries like that yeah, I I do if I know that they are, I I'm not sure how to like maybe it's like pure in their intentions for doing it, um, because there's plenty of films that that I watch and and I have a, 
I have a pretty strong stomach for stuff, but but anything that gets into for me being a huge horror fan, I like if it gets too much into what it would be classified to me as like torture porn yeah. sort of stuff like that. It's it's not my thing. I yeah, I, me too. I I turned off of that a long time ago. Where like I maybe saw the first like saw or maybe even the second around the third it started to become like ah, i'm just watching someone be tortured and, and i really don't want to see that mm-hmm. um I'd, I'd rather have some suspense i'd rather have just more you know i don't mind a great slasher i love slashers but um but so anytime a filmmaker if i read a script and i can tell it's just for shock value or or i can see or if i meet the director and i can tell they're just like ah, i just want to you know push the boundary but there's not a real intention behind it it doesn't add to the story it add to the story and it's like and i also know that their motives are then purely shock value and and that i don't want mm-hmm. i'm like you know you can go shock anybody that's pretty easy yeah. and so i'd rather see you have to push against that or really commit to no i'm doing this because i'm really trying to make a statement about this. like okay then i then i can get behind you um, there's certain roles I won't take. There's some stuff where I'm, it's more for, I don't want to be in that headspace where yeah. I'm just like, you know what, as an actor, you have to commit. And there's some stuff where I'm like, I, I really don't want to have to put myself through that. And mm-hmm. and maybe that's not being as committed of an actor as I should be, but I just know personally, I, I can't put myself through it. Absolutely. So, you know, so. I totally respect that. And I feel the exact yeah. same way. Now, one of the uh, greatest scenes in that movie is when your guys are in that uh, abandoned church, I guess is what it is, the building. (laughs) That is, okay, I got to ask you this, okay? Yeah. Uh, With the the, uh, statue of Christ on the floor, and uh, it starts talking. Now, it was done great, all right? Yeah, but it was done beautifully well. Did you read that and you're like, wow, this might, if it's not done right, might come across corny, which it did Absolutely. not. It was done perfectly, scary, totally within the, of what, you know, would freak you out. Yeah. But did you have a worry that if it's not done properly, it might take the movie in the wrong direction? Yeah. Absolutely. Like there's, that's, that's what's so, I think, scary, <laughs> like with any film is, uh, you're always taking a risk because you you can give the greatest performance you've ever given and you feel amazing. And if somebody edits it terribly, you look awful, yeah. you know, <laughs> and it's out of your control. Uh, and with that, especially with practical and visual effects, like we knew that I knew that was going to be digital. Um, I love practical effects. I love any time like I love seeing them create it, make it like, you know, all right, we're going to three, two, one, go. All right. Head comes off. And now, we're, you know, blood's everywhere. Awesome. Uh, those are some of my favorite. I, I love it. Eat it up. Um, with that, we, we had an actor and I'm playing it on his name. You can look him up, but he's, he, he did all the physical and the voice, you know, and essentially though, like anything that's being done digitally, he's essentially in like pajamas, you know, yeah. <laughs> he's got on sort of like these black, you know, pajamas, like kind of thing over his head so they can do all the digital over the top. And he was amazing. He was really going for it, giving all these contortions and voice and really getting into it. Um, and he's actually a comedian. I think he's uh, he was a comic, like stand up comic. I forgot how he got the role, but he was wonderful and oh, just yeah. like nailed it. But yeah, you, I know from from watching all these films, from all the films I've seen, from from seeing it happen. Uh, you get a bad effect, it it looks terrible, mm-hmm. and it, it completely destroys the performance. I mean, if you have a really bad effect of, all right, here's you know this this statue character Jesus, and then all of a sudden you know it looks awful, and you cut back to us, and we're really giving it our all, we look stupid. Yeah. <laughs> like, and, there, and there's no way to save it. I do know that they, because uh, Amelia had said they, because they had some time between putting it out. And I know that was a big reason why it took a while because they were just making sure because he, he knew that too. He was like, "If this looks bad, this ro- movie crashes. Exactly. Like it just stopped dead right. right here, and it's stupid from this point on." Mm-hmm. You know, and so, so I think that was one of theirs where they really labored over getting that one right. I, I know it became a thing where like, "All right, more money so we can make sure this this effect is right." <laughs> like, let's get it in there. But it um, was worth it. It was worth that, it. That scene was amazing. Uh, you know the. I forget what was the name of your co-actor in that in that scene. Oh, it's uh, it's uh, Joaquin. Um, uh, crap. 
Because he was just in, uh, he's just in yeah, Suicide Squad. Yeah, Club. the names are on the tip of my tongue, too. He was great. So, uh, you know. He was great in Belzebeth as well. And you guys had this great on screen chemistry together. Like, yeah. He was the skeptic. You were the one that Weird. was, you know, the scientist. He's also, like, uh, he's a house. Like, yeah. that man is giant. <laughs> like, uh, I always thought he could have just crushed me within his hands. And, like, uh, but he was the sweetest man. Um, and like, he's a superstar. Cause like yeah. he was also, we asked so many people, uh, cause we shot, um, I want to say two weeks in Mexicali. So right across the border, I would stay there and then sometimes drive back on the weekends to help out my wife with our, you know, fairly newborn. Yeah. Um, and then we shot for five weeks in Mexico city, which was amazing. I'd never been. And, uh, and that's where Joaquin's from. And, and so people would be stopping him on the street or anytime we were on set and be like, hey, you know, you're, you know, and he'd go take photos. He's a and, big star there. I mean, yeah. And like, and he's been in, uh, cause I knew him initially from, uh, uh, he's one of the villains for, um, Juan Masalas, uh, for, uh, yeah. <laughs> and so, so yeah, I was like, oh God, you're in a James Bond film and I'm a huge James Bond fan. Like, this is amazing. Um, and, and he basically like, he, it was, it was weird. I don't want to like, uh, not like, I guess like, Call him out and say, it, it, I know he, it was so strange to see somebody who's such an amazing actor, and he is, he was almost nervous about some of the English speaking parts, mm -hmm. where he, I could, he would get shy about it, and I was like, what's, you know, and he, he's like, ah, it's not, I was like, you're amazing. Oh, like, you're good, amazing. yeah. And I was like, uh, I promise you, it's much better than my Spanish, so <laughs> you're great. Um, and, uh, and he was just one of these sweetest men, uh, and really gave it his all was so committed um and just it was amazing to listen to him talk yeah. uh for um uh I'm blanking on my other because he was in amoris peros and uh, he was the other detective yeah. and, and he wonderful we got to go to his house he made us a giant like paella as a going away thing and we all stirred it up and it was delicious and um but really had an amazing time there. Yeah. The re I mean, a part of the reason that made the movie, uh, one of the many factors that made the movie so good is how your guys' relationship in the movie evolved. In the beginning, he thought, oh, you're a gringo, get out of my country. And then you see this mutual respect start to build and, you know, to the ultimate ending, which uh, we're not going to spoil for people who want to go <laughs> see it. It's a great movie. Some people are probably hearing about it for the first time right now. Uh, I I believe I saw it. Is, is it available on Shutter? Yes, it is. Okay. Yeah, because that's where like um, I I forget where I saw it initially. Uh, Emilio had sent it to me, so that's where I saw it initially. Uh, but yeah, it's on Shutter right now. Uh, so which is really cool because yeah. I'm a huge Shutter fan. That'll be my. That's normally my. All right, uh, you know, go to the hour. Yeah, yeah. So if you guys want to see, it's Belzebeth, and it's available yeah. on Shutter. Uh, we only have a, a minute or two left. Yeah. What do you have coming up that we should know about? Um, well, just finished uh, shooting. That was the other thing I just shot uh, up in the uh, in Angel's Crest uh, in Los Angeles. Um, a movie called Jess Plus None. It'll be. Still in editing right now. It'll probably be a while before it's out. I'm sure it'll probably do uh, the uh, festival circuit. Um, one to look out for, though. It's a comedy, though, and I had an absolutely amazing time on it. The cast is wonderful. You can go look it up on IMDb. Mm -hmm. um, but it was one of those times, again, of like, we're all here. We were all essentially a summer camp. It's supposed to take place over a weekend wedding. And just a bunch of actors and directors and writers and everybody just making a film, you know, and that's some of the best times. Yeah. Like everybody's there just to, to make a movie. And so there's no, you know, worrying about too much with the budget and you're just, you're having fun. Uh, so whenever you see that, give it a watch. Um, and then I'm about to go shoot another thing called a chorus that just got, which will be kind of intense. It's more of a drama. Um, and then like, you know, just episodes, you'll also see me probably coming up in a few commercials recently cause I just had to shoot a few. <laughs> so, so that'll that's be awesome. That's I expect, awesome. All right. Like, it sounds um, like you're doing great and you're very, uh, they're keeping you busy. That's awesome. I love the, I I've been staring at that artwork in the back. I think oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> you did all that. Yeah. Oh, this is mine. So yeah. Like oh, this is man. all my stuff. Oh man. Uh, that yeah. is awesome. Tate, thank Thanks. you so much for coming on this hour just flew by uh i rambled quick, so. <laughs> no no it was awesome getting to hear your stories and to hear how you got into acting and the Quanticos, uh sinister to the uh endless and belzebeth thank
Thank you so much for letting me know how to pronounce it. <laughs> <laughs> it took me a while. I kept wanting to say something different. They were like, no, Belzebub. I was like, okay. <laughs> so thank you again for joining us, guys. I hope you enjoyed this interview as much as we did. Uh, any final thoughts you want to share before we go? Uh, just uh, keep uh, keep listening to Dead Talk Live and then uh, keep watching horror films. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's keep horror going. Guys, thank you so much. Have a great weekend. Till Monday, stay safe. And on behalf of Tate... And myself, stay walking. Good night. Absolutely.